Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Nicholas Pino, the EMF guy. Nick is an investigative health journalist, educator, and advocate for safe technologies. He is also the author of The Non Tinfoil Guide to EMFs, which tackles the very serious topic of electromagnetic pollution with humor and common sense. Keep listening to the end of the podcast for a special offer on Nick's Electro Smog course. All right, well, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today we have Nick Pino, who is a very, very intelligent guy who I love talking to. And his book, The Non Tinfoil Guide to EMFs, is by far the best book I've seen on the topic, not only because it addresses all the key issues shows the science uh, of how electromagnetic pollution can disrupt human physiology. But it's actually quite readable even to lay people, and it helps people formulate pictures in their minds so they have a sort of a capacity to perceive what is often uh, something that we don't think about a lot. So, Nick, I just want to start by saying, once again, thank you for the excellent job that you've done on your book and for all the great work you're doing with your online course. And uh, as you know, I've encouraged various podcasters to interview you because I felt your message was so important. I'm excited to be able to have you here with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. It's uh, It's been too long since we last talked uh, last year. Yes, we've been trying, but it's just <laughs> the, the the nature of all the moving pieces has been quite a dance. But we we yeah. we're, we are here. Perfect. Well, I I can't wait to get started and uh, talk some EMFs today. Yeah, I'd love it if you could. You know, uh, you know, I don't know how many of my listeners are familiar with you. I know you've been out there a fair bit now, and I'm sure that you've probably had to answer this question over and over again. So forgive me for the redundancies, but we want to give people a chance to have a sense of connection to you personally uh, that haven't any familiarity with you. So can you just give us an overview of how you got involved in educating people about the dangers of electromagnetic uh, frequencies and related and what led to the writing of your book, The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMFs? Sure, it's a it's a long journey. I started uh, in 2010, just writing about health out of self interest. I, I got out of school. I, I have a background in communications. Um, some part was journalism. Some part was uh, advertising, copywriting, and I started as professional copywriter in these years too. But also writing about health that was really my passion. And uh, working as a copywriter for TV was really my job. So I envisioned the moment in my life where I would be talking about health and making a living out of it. So I made that a reality in 2013, uh, writing mainly about uh, the food industry and food-related topics, weight loss, overall health, and eventually it morphed into more uh, a holistic view of health as I, I started to learn more. And in 2014, 2015, I started writing a few books about EMFs. And the first and, and most influential book for me was Deborah Davis' uh, Disconnect. And that's a great one from, I think she published it in 2010. So it, it had a few year uh, um, of of really uh, reviews uh, backing it up, and it was written in, in a way that just uh, I don't know the the message just shocked me because Deborah Davis, after all, she's a a very high level scientist, and she has been uh, um, co um, how do we say this co receiver of a, a of a noble. So, and she has been working for for governments and industry alike for for decades, especially about environmental toxicity issues, like um, certain uh, issues around heavy metal contamination in the environment. So she's someone, let's say we can consider from the mainstream, uh, and she was she became an advocate for for EMF and for safety. Uh, uh, of wireless devices a few years back. So the fact that this person I was reading was extremely credible and very sane, uh, it, uh-huh. it kind of surprised me because I thought the topic was a non-issue, right? So one thing led 
to another, I had to read a second book and a third book and every book on the topic and eventually every website and every video almost, I, I feel like I, 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 I almost, uh, read the entire internet when it comes to EMFs and and I discovered well oh, wow not only is that is that is that topic credible in fact when you get the real facts uh, and and you kind of don't listen to to people who uh, kind of push it aside as a topic that's fringe or conspiracy uh, conspiracy theories or extraterrestrials kind of bizarre uh, fringe <laughs> topics right that that's that's what most people thought it was and that that's what I thought it was at first so I came up with the idea okay well uh, Deborah Davis book is incredible I loved every second of it I loved all the other books out there but in reality it took me about two solid years of research to start grasping the topics and the topic and and I talked with my wife, Jan, who's also uh, the co-CEO for our publishing company. And I said, and I was constantly talking about EMS. So she was starting to get fed up with me a little bit. But at, this, at the same time, I could I could see that most of the time she didn't understand a word I was saying because it is a very complicated topic. And this is why there's a lot of confusion around it. So I figured I need to make this information extremely simple. And I, I need to make my wife, Jen, understand the topic, but also my grandma and also uh, a five-year-old children. And if I can do that and I can create a simple guide, uh, I'll have succeeded in my mission. And on top of that, the second layer of my mission I felt was, okay, let's add humor in there. And even in the title, the non-tinfoil guide to EMS, let's, let's address the fact that most people think it's crazy and then bring them into my world, open the book, and then make them realize, just like I did a few years back, that this is credible. So that's my journey until 2017. And uh, when I published the book, I barely could, could I, I still made a living out, out of publishing health information uh, overall on my newsletter and whatnot. And I, and I felt, okay, now I envision a new a new direction in my life, which is talking just about EMS and being able to make a living. So book sales were starting to ramp up a little bit, but it was not sufficient. And eventually we saw an opportunity with my team uh, because health uh, professionals around the world and even health enthusiasts that are looking for more in-depth information, uh, they had loved the book, but at the same time, they wanted more and more information. They wanted more information about the symptoms, about how can you uncover uh, which person is more affected by EMS and, and which person is not, and very technical questions also that I, I got on a regular basis. And this is when um, this started the journey in 2018, uh, last year of creating Reading the course Electrosmog RX, which we we can uh, chat about more, but it, it ended up being a very thorough course of about twelve to fourteen hours of EMF education, and um, I created this because there's no course out there in functional medicine about EMS, and and it's not that there's no information; it's not it's just that no one took the time to summarize all of this information. So it took me months of additional work and we, we launched it in collaboration with uh, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart and uh, a lot of different scientists, doctors, and international collaborators. So I guess that's the, the entire story. And nowadays I'm focused on, well, the, the book is still extremely relevant, even if things uh, obviously have evolved in the last two years. And the course is is just starting to to get known a little bit. And there's so much work to do. And I'm still advocating, uh, writing, um, talking about the course, the book, doing podcasts. That's just what I'm doing right now. And uh, just perfecting my knowledge because the topic uh, is still, after two years, I see I see it evolving uh, from something that was completely not credible to something that might be credible, but it's it, it's still very it, there's so much controversy around it that a large fraction of let's say what we could call the the mainstream scientific and mainstream medical communities still think it's a non-issue and that it's still tinfoil, unfortunately. And I'm trying to fix that, but we we have a lot of work to do. Well, <clears throat> I wish I could give you a, a forecast for the capacity to download this kind of information into everybody's head quickly. But <laughs> as a guy who has been talking about 
many, many issues with regard to food and health for a very long time. A lot of these issues I began lecturing on in, you know, as early as 89, 2000. And I can tell you that uh, it just takes a while because uh, people are so conditioned by the media and by the corporations that gain so much from misinformation that we're really having to decondition people, which is a lot harder than being the first one there. I mean, you know, there's an old saying in Christianity, the uh, preachers say, if you give me a child, I will give you a preacher, which simply means that they, they have nothing to work against. They can program them very quickly. So we are working against uh, corporate entities with their own agendas, unfortunately, most of which, as you know, are driven by profit, not really concerned for, uh, you know, side effects like people's health. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. But um, I'm wondering, you know, that was a perfect, what you just shared was a perfect entryway to my next question. Can you give us a summary of what EMFs are and how they interact with human cells and physiological systems? Just because I'd like to take this, like you said, assuming that there's going to be a lot of people listening that don't really, I mean, we most people talk about EMFs, but they don't really understand what waves are and how waves interact with physiology. Um, so if you could just, in your own way, overview what an EMF wave is or frequency is and how does that affect human cells and physiological systems sure um so let me let me preface some people are gonna kind of glance over this interview and say oh emfs that's that's probably not the right term to use because either it's electromagnetic fields or electromagnetic frequencies but these emfs are everywhere in nature right the sun emits emfs uh, some of which we see which is visible light that's the type of emf and some of which we don't uv radiation and some uh some part of the spectrum of infrared we don't see but we know that these things have effects. UV can uh, damage your DNA if we, you get too much. There are mm-hmm. links with, uh, with with cancer that <laughs> some are, some argue are are are, are not uh, substantiated. But anyway, uh, so in nature you have EMFs and they are everywhere. However, what my work is all about is the new EMFs that we have introduced. Uh, we humans and and nature too. And these brand new EMFs had not been seen before the introduction of electricity. When we electrified uh, the planet, um, and that's not so long ago, just a few decades back, you still had uh, part of the countryside in the US and in other countries that uh, were without electricity. 1940s, 1950s, uh, pretty much every uh, the, the entire electrification of uh, civilization in North America finally uh, was completed. But before that, we were not exposed to household electricity, for example. So you have certain right. frequencies and, and certain signal characteristics of these EMFs that are different than back in nature. So, so that's, that's just a, a fact that I need to establish. And in nature, uh, let's say, it, I think it's, it's a safe assumption to say that um, EMFs in nature have been created and are, let's say, biocompatible with uh, humans and animals and plants because we have been evolving at the same time of these type of radiation, whether it's certain types of solar radiation that that hit the planet or even the EMFs that are emitted by uh, it, by the planet itself, which is uh, one of which is a magnetic field uh, uh, at a frequency of around 7.83 hertz or at least one of the harmonics is called the Schumann resonance. So mm-hmm. yeah, you have certain... EMFs that we know in science uh, will um, improve human performance, which is when one of them is is true uh, earthing or grounding. You put your bare feet on the ground and you do have an entrainment effect of this certain frequency that optimizes sleep and uh, kind of calms down the nervous system. And we know that the sun has benefits too. It will simulate vitamin D production and will uh, raise up your uh, neurotransmitter if you if you have 
all this light hitting your retina, you have the circadian rhythms, and, and science is just starting to appreciate in the last few years with a few noble in science given, uh, I think, might have been last year or 2016 about circadian rhythms. It, we're just starting to appreciate how closely, uh, let's say, dependent we are on certain natural rhythms and certain EMFs from nature. So w w with that in mind, the, the question now is how these new EMFs that we're introducing, so you can talk about cell phones, uh, which uses certain frequencies to communicate wirelessly, right? The cell towers that are associated and that we need to have everywhere around in order to get coverage, uh, but also household electricity or the fact that we use electricity creates both electrical fields or magnetic fields. So there are different types of fields that our biology is not accustomed to. And the belief is, and this is really why I think we'll we'll talk about safety standards in a bit, but the belief was in science that these fields uh, can be classified in two categories. You have ion ionizing radiation that uh, that starts basically with x-rays and goes up uh, all, all the way up the MF spectrum to to gamma radiation and nuclear radiation, which we know has enough uh, power to directly break DNA and and break the the bonds between molecules. So so we know that um, on on a physics standpoint, these these fields are dangerous. Ionizing radiation, and that that's important to understand that uh, just a few decades ago, it was not a fact in science. It was actually taught that these fields were perfectly fine, which is why, for example, in shoe stores back in uh, might have been the 1930s up to the 1940s, we used x-rays just to look at children's feet and see if they were the right fit. So not so long ago in human history, we did not know that x-rays were dangerous. And when science finally caught up and uh, regulatory agencies looked at that, they said, oh my God, what are we doing? Let's stop these practices. And from now on, our EMF exposure when it comes to X-rays and ionizing radiation is going to be controlled. So if we're to have an X-ray, we need to uh, to weigh the benefits versus risks. And, and the more science evolves, I think the less we're going to use X-rays because we're finding other ways to maybe do imagery that's as effective, but that doesn't have the detrimental effect. So with that being said, there's also the non-ionizing radiation. And the, the cell phones, the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the cell towers, and the household electricity all fall in this category. And the thought was, well, there's no way on earth that this type of radiation has enough power to directly break your DNA. Hence, it is 100% safe. So they looked, the, the, the only way that it could damage is that if the intensity is high enough to overheat your tissues. So that was the initial thought. And this is how, with, with this scientific understanding, this is how we rolled out uh, so much, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, the biggest amount of uh, new man-made EMFs in human history in the last 20 years with the advent of the smartphone, especially the last 10, and then especially the last five. And the next 10 years are going to be even more tremendous when it comes to uh, what kind of volume of EMFs we're, we're receiving com compared to ancestral backgrounds. So as a result, based on the, on this, uh, let's say, false assumption of safety, we've increased uh, the EMFs in, in the frequency of cell phones, so about um, anywhere from 900 megahertz to 2.7 gigahertz. Uh, this frequency right now, the average city has... Uh, has uh, basically a quintillion times the levels of EMFs compared to ancestral backgrounds in this range. So you have certain ranges that are the same as before in nature, but in nature you did not have this uh, this radio frequency range with so much power. And this is the average kind of electro pollution that we have in cities right now. So uh, it doesn't say if it's safe or dangerous, but it says that, oh my God, we're increasing this. So let's hope it's not, it's not detrimental. So 
the problem with this whole idea that non-ionizing radiation doesn't do anything and that only heats matter, so only if you overheat tissue, uh, you can create damage, and if it doesn't overheat, everything is fine. It, it's simply that it's not true, and that it was, a, it was a controversial idea in science dating back from the 1970s. Uh, so it, it's, it's not even a new idea that there are such things as non-heating effects. In other words, you, be, below this threshold of heating damage, you still see effects, and you could see effects like oxidative damage. You could see effects like DNA damage, reduced sperm count, and various effects on the cellular and mitochondrial levels that have been shown in so many studies. I'm talking about thousands of different studies. So it's not a new idea. It's just that the validity of, of this entire argument and how we should deal with it is still controversial. But uh, so this is this is kind of what's crazy. And and. Part of the reason I think that um, most scientists say, oh, well, the, 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 non, the non-heating effects are non-existent is just that they think, they, they still rely on physics and say, well, it's impossible because it's, it's non-ionizing radiation. It doesn't damage anything. But, but then the mechanisms have started to be elucidated in just the last few years. And one researcher that has shown something tremendous uh, and, and done such, such great work is Dr. Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, from the Washington State University. And what Dr. Paul did differently is that he looked at all the various studies that um, showed basically the mechanism that explains how is it possible that a very low level EMF, such as a cell phone, could have an impact on the cell. Because the, the idea in physics was, um, well, it, doesn't, it, it can break DNA. So if it has an effect, what part of the cell senses EMFs? How is it possible, right? And they, we didn't know. But now we're starting to uncover in science that certain parts of the cell and certain, uh, let's say, uh, as, if, as if you have just uh, uh, the, t- uh, the tires of your car that are affected by something. It's just one part of the cell. And one such part is the voltage-gated calcium channels and also other uh, ion channels. So you have on on the cell, you have various channels that shuttle um, ions, um, so minerals, out of the cell and inside the cell from minerals that are just floating in the um, the external um, intracellular matrix. So basically, what Paul, what Dr. Paul has uncovered, is that these calcium channels get stuck open when they are exposed to outside or foreign signals, foreign signals that were never there in nature. And what is the the direct consequence of that? Well, you you get an overflow of calcium inside the cell, and this overflow of calcium itself leads to a slew of other effects. And I don't I don't think if you want me to go in detail, I can I can talk about the mechanisms in detail, but the overall result is oxidative damage, which can lead to DNA breaks, single and double bonds. So what does that mean? <clears throat> that we've rolled out to the entire population a technology that is based on a completely false assumption of no damage can possibly happen. And that in the end, the same DNA damage that is created, that is being created by ionizing radiation can also be created by non-ionizing radiation and through the exact same mechanisms. And that's important because looking back at ionizing radiation, and let's say you have exposure to nuclear particles, most of the damage is not happening through this direct effect of DNA breakage, but is happening afterwards because of the oxidative damage. And one such particle that is extremely damaging to the cell, uh, an oxy, um, a nitrogen uh, reactive species, is peroxynitrite. And I've read uh, a, a great paper lately, I think it's 2015, reviewing the, the biological effects of being exposed to nuclear radiation. And it, it clearly states that most of the damage is not happening when you're exposed. That's part of the damage. Maybe... I don't know if they say 20, 30%, but the bulk of the damage is happening afterwards from the downstream biological effect and and the number one 
um, detriment to the cell was this peroxynitrite oxidative species. But guess what? <laughs> Dr. Paul, when it comes to non-ionizing radiation, has, has found that the number one thing that happens with too much cell and uh, too much calcium inside the cell, intracellular calcium, is the creation of peroxynitrite. So in the end, we don't know to what extent. We don't know what's the amount of non-ionizing radiation we need uh, compared to ionizing radiation to create kind of the same damage. But what we know or what is not acknowledged, but what I think and, and Dr. Paul thinks is happening is that Unfortunately, we've essentially rolled out a technology that 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 is as dangerous or hazardous as ionizing radiation, but now to the entire population, not just it and and twenty four seven. So the the extent of the problem we could have created can be much much worse compared to anything that we've rolled out to the population before. Yes, and it, it seems so innocuous because. You know, we've slowly been indoctrinated into the use of technologies like cell phones and uh, various electronic gadgets. I mean, microwaves slowly snuck their way into everything as microwave ovens. And we've got, you know, more and more technology being mounted everywhere. And we can get into the 5G issues in a bit here, but it's as though, you know, Corporations are very quick to try to come up with these, you know, <clears throat> so-called advanced technologies that are supposed to be helpful or whatever the driving motive is, but without really doing due diligence to the complications. And, and you know, we see the same kinds of challenges in, in many industries from uh, materials yeah. being used to build homes. I mean, a, a new carpet outgasses 131 carcinogenic chemicals. For the first year, it's on the floor, and then it fades out. New cars are toxic, so it's it's you know we've got chlorine in our water, mercury in our dental fillings, and we and so this is certainly not um, a new problem in context with it being a challenge, but the question is, a what's the magnitude of this thing and how far can it go? While you were sh sharing there, I wrote down a few notes I'd like to share because I think it might help put some context into some of these issues. Um, years ago, when all this stuff started winding up, I started looking into EMFs, and I came across a paper by Professor Ross Addy, and he stated in his paper that the when they measured the signal strength of a cell phone, so for example, if someone's got a cell phone to their head and they're inside of a building, the frequencies tend to come through the windows because the structure of the building acts like a... Um, a Faraday cage. That's why people ob often find they can't talk in a large building unless they go stand by a window. But he showed that the cell signal strength, so when you're standing in the building, if the phone's against your right ear and the window that the signal's making it to the phone through is on the left side of you, that signal's passing right through your brain into the cell phone. He said that that signal was one million times stronger than the signal that brain neurons use to communicate with each other. I'm I'm not surprised. So and that, it, it, in nature, it's it's very very low voltage, and we're yeah. putting uh, we're putting electricity of tremendous levels in the air, basically compared to let's say compared to how how much electricity is triggering these voltage-gated calcium channels. Well, Dr. Paul has done some calculations, and they're very, let's say, a ballpark measurement, but he, he, he assesses that at levels 7.2 million times lower than our safety standards, these VGCCs can still be activated. So it's, it's we're talking about one Wi-Fi from your neighbor at several hundred feet could be sufficient to have some biological effect. So our it shows that our sensors, our built-in sensors in our cells and our mitochondria are much more attuned to the environment and sensitive than anyone could have imagined when the technology was first rolled out. Yes, absolutely. So a couple other things I wanted to share just to add some context for people is that there's a 
a law called the Arndt Schultz law in medicine. Are you familiar with it? I'm not. I don't remember what it is. <laughs> okay. Well, unless you'd studied a lot of uh, medical physiology, most people aren't familiar with it, but I have researched a lot of these things. The Arndt Schultz law, A-R-N-D-T dash S-C-H-U-L-Z law, which you can find in most medical dictionaries, uh, especially if they're, you know, like 10 or 15 years old, because it's an it's a law that's been around for quite a while. But the Arndt Schultz law says weak stimuli activate physiological processes, moderate stimuli favor them, and strong stimuli inhibit them. And most people wouldn't realize that when he's saying weak stimuli activate physiological processes, he's speaking of the level of stimuli that's inherent to the construction of the physical body, the human body, which, as we were just discussing, is extremely low frequencies and amplitudes and voltages. So you study the, the uh, someone like Dr. Jerry Tennant, and you can get an idea of what kind of micro voltages are involved. But the other thing that people don't realize is that research on water shows that the water molecule is it is wickedly sensitive to vibration and, and is reactive to vibration at, at, at I, I don't remember the exact frequency range, but it's massive. They say it's probably the most sensitive molecule in nature to vibration. And because water has an infinite capacity for memory, what is a concern for me is that when we're using these technologies or we're exposed to them, whether we realize it or not, they're actually uh, causing an oscillation of our water cells. A, a microwave oven, I think, oscillates a water cell from positive to negative, you know, several billion times a second, which is what ultimately produces the heat that cooks the food. But that has shown to be very destructive to the cells within the uh, food being heated. The example I give is all you got to do is microwave an egg and compare that to a, a poached or a fried egg. And it tastes like something, you know, more like styrofoam or something from another planet. But the water molecules have been oscillated at such high frequencies that actually obliterates the cell to the point that it doesn't even function like or taste like human food. And then Hans Hertel's research showed that whenever anyone ate anything out of a microwave, it caused a significant increase in white blood cells because the body was attacking the food as a foreign agent. So when we look at the fact that water is not only highly sensitive to these vibrations, it means that because we're about 65 to 70% water, when we're being hit by these frequencies, it's amping up the whole body. In other words, the whole body is beginning to vibrate just like as if, if you put a human being inside a microwave, it wouldn't take long and they would start cooking. And so we have the sensitivity to water molecules. We have an issue that we're designed to run on the frequencies that are natural in nature, not the frequencies we're introducing. And then my final comment that I think is really important is if you look at the human construct, and this is well-researched by people like William A. Tiller, you can look at the book, um, The Encyclopedia of Subtle Energy Anatomy by Cynthia Dale. And what we find is that all the human glands and organs, which can be categorized by the chakra system, are in very specific frequency ranges. So when you look at the chakra system, the heart is in the green range and the heart's frequency is around 528. But each gland and organ has its own frequency range. So anytime we're exposed to stressors, such as electromagnetic pollution, drugs, poisons, various other toxins, um, anything that uh, caffeine, for example, will stimulate the system to, to high levels. If we overstimulate any of those glands or organs, then we have too much energy running through them. And that's where the name disease comes from, meaning dis-ease. So we're, we're actually um, putting our bodies into a milu that through the strength of the energy in, uh, transfer, as Ross Addy says, a cell phone's a million times more powerful than the signal that your brain uses to talk to itself. And to put that into context, I say to people, imagine having a normal conversation with somebody and all of a sudden the volume of their voice went up to one million times greater. What would happen to you? 
And most people get it right. They say, I would probably fly to pieces. Well, that's exactly what we're doing to ourselves. We're flying to pieces while we think we've got life made easier. And my final comment, and I think this is really critical, is people don't realize that all life is made of energy and information. The human body is a form, it's a formation, and energy enters into our body and carries information. So we are in formation. But the information that makes for a healthy body isn't ubiquitous. We, are, we can't be healthy with all forms of energy and information. And so we're using energy to transfer information and frequencies. But because the water in our body can record anything, and energy medicine, as you surely know, shows you can completely remove every atom from a substance. You can even record frequencies using advanced technology, and they can become medicine for people, and they can make water that carries the frequencies of various drugs and herbs, but there's not one bit of the drug or herb in there because it has the energy signature and the information that was carried by the source product. So when we're adding energy and information to our bodies that is not compatible, then we end up with too much energy for the frequency ranges of our systems, and the information entering our body is potentially very, very chaotic. It's, it's like if, if too many people talk to you at one time, you can't understand any of them, no matter how clear each of them is being. And so how do you feel when I share these concepts with regard to energy, information, dis-ease, and frequency ranges? This is exactly right. This is an, uh, an understanding that's uh, lacking from medical science in, in a profound way. And I, I'm, I'm aware of a lot of what you're talking about, Jerry Tennant, uh, uh, healing is voltage or voltage is healing, something like that. And yeah. <clears throat> it, it, what is shown is information that, that needs to make it to the mainstream, that we are uh, electrical and biological beings. But yes. I think that the... Uh, science, medical science especially, is stuck with this idea that we are just bio chemical. We are a slew of different chemicals. There are reactions. But uh, even the physics don't work when they try to explain how fast uh, a, a hormone can be received by a hormone uh, receptor and how fast we can react to uh, or certain biological processes are happening cannot be explained by molecules, which are very slow. Uh, they can maybe be explained by electricity or things that are happening even faster than that on, on a quantum level. But things are very unclear. And, and what I want to say also is that what I like, Paul, is that you have a, a very, very high level understanding and explanations that you you provided, which is extremely important because in the end, what I'm afraid of, or let's say concerned when it comes to these MMA DMFs is not what we know about them. It's what we don't. <laughs> so how is it affecting the, the water molecules? How is it affecting the microbiome? How is it affecting mitochondria? Uh, ju just these three topics alone could, I mean, we, we have decades and decades and, and, and trillions of dollars in investing in the right studies that I don't know who's going to fund. That's another question. But we, we need to elucidate these things while we change technology for something else that, that's more uh, healthful or, or compatible with our biology. But right now, what's happening is that the technology there there's no there's no one who understands human physiology and how it's affected by electricity that sits on the engineering team at Apple or at Samsung or for Verizon or any tech giant there's no one there's not one engineer that that has a background in in biology that would let's say look at the question how can we create signals that are compatible with um, the sensors, the innate sensors we have in, in our cells. And maybe it could be possible, but at the moment, it's not even uh, a criteria when they create technology. Well, I think uh, one of the challenges, Nick, <laughs> we human beings, every one of us are the study to see exactly what this is going to do. The challenge is, though, in research, you have to get 
people's permission and you have to inform them of what they're being exposed to. If you join a drug study and maybe they'll pay you to uh, to try a new drug, you're informed of what the potential side effects and the risks are so that you can decide whether you want to be part of the study or not. And they have human ethics uh, committees involved in all research projects at universities to protect students from the potential dangers of being involved in certain research projects. But ultimately what's happening is the corporations are, are turning every one of us into their guinea pigs. Yet, as I'm sure you're aware, they don't really want to know the truth of this science when it comes to this kind of information because it means retooling, it means uh, more advanced technology, it means where they have to admit that they were wrong and that opens them to lawsuits, it means yes. uh, you know, a long string of things. But I think part of what I think I'd like everyone to know, and I know you too on this podcast, is that we're all guinea pigs in a very big study. And the outcome, based on what we've already observed in scientific investigations, isn't pretty. And it's kind of like the vaccination thing. I, I, you know, I've seen many documentaries now where medical doctors' own children got either seriously injured or killed by vaccinations, and they took it upon themselves to begin doing their own research. And so far, every single one of them I've seen in documentaries was downright upset, pissed off, and felt betrayed by the medical community and found all sorts of situations where research had been modified or buried and that they were not informed effectively in medical schools. But I'm, my point is that it took a crisis in their own family before they really started investigating this stuff. And several of them have said, how painful it is for them to bear the weight of knowing how many kids they vaccinated before they actually had to look into the deeper truth that they hadn't seen before. So really what I'm saying is if we don't all get together and start paying attention to people like yourself that are devoting uh, their lives to making us aware of what we need to stand up together for as a democracy, then we're really stuck back with the government being a corporate headquarters and having no interest in the people, but really in just making piles of money. And the sad part of it is the sicker people get, the more money they make on the other end of the equation with all the, you know, health challenges. And I've done a lot of research into issues like this. And I found uh, research published in the journal The Ecologist when I was doing research to write my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. And what they did is they investigated the boards of directors of several major corporations, such as cigarette corporations, alcohol, uh, people, uh, corporations making alcoholic beverages and, and various other such things. And they showed something very interesting that the almost across the board, the shareholders of major corporations had both invested in the alcohol and drugs and programs for getting people off alcohol. With R.J. Reynolds and companies like that, they found that the board of directors had invested in the cigarettes, but they'd also invented in all sorts of uh, snickerette gums. And so they basically what they do is they invest their money in the problem and the solution. So they win no matter which way people go until we realize that even the solutions they're investing in are usually not effective. Jeez. Yeah, I didn't know that one. But I mean, it's it's bad. When it comes to wireless, Paul, you know, the wireless and, and tech industry right now is the number one largest industry on the planet. It is larger by, by I don't know what the, the latest numbers are, but it is way larger than, far, than Big Pharma. So if we know that I mean, big pharma. Obviously, it's not it's not all black. It's not all white. It's somewhere in the gray area. But a lot of things have been found where obviously companies are investing towards creating studies that show no effect, or just lobby for certain regulations that are very loose and makes them able to uh, 
test, um, I don't know, spend one year testing a pharmaceutical drug instead of two years because faster to market, more profits. So it's all, all profit driven. We saw what happened with Big Pharma. Well, the same thing, it's not like I don't have faith in humanity, but throughout multiple industries, we have the same problem where an industry is is profit driven. And it's not initially that they want to, I don't get in, into these things, Paul. You know, some people hear about EMFs and they say uh, these companies want to do harm. I'm I'm not sure, but I'm you know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I consider myself a simple man. Like I I, I don't want to think that people are 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 creating cell phones or um, installing towers to kind of damage the population or like some people can say Nick you don't understand the deep politics that's okay but that's not why I'm spreading the message what what I'm trying to to say is that uh, I I think if they knew better they would do better but their decisions are all driven by profits. So if if even someone who's a CEO of a, of a large company wanted tomorrow morning to start selling a healthier cell phone, well, it, it opens up the door, as you said, to, okay, well, does that mean that the previous model was dangerous? And, uh, and, and maybe they're going to fail as a company. So in other words, what's going to happen, this CEO is going to get fired and replaced with another one that continues business as usual. So it is a very complicated portrait that we're facing. But one thing is clear as far as the science goes is that there's an extreme bias uh, towards finding no effect and continuing business as usual. And some people tend to listen to like conversations like the one we're having and say, oh, it's a big conspiracy. Well, no, it's how, the, I don't know, like, I don't know what to tell you. It's it's how the world works. And if you still somehow think that uh, science is all all, all clear and all clean and all everything is is fine and dandy. I think you're just uh, very illusion illusion still about what science is, and it, it, it's it all comes back to uh, the regulatory agencies and are they protecting us in an independent manner the way they should? And if they did maybe we wouldn't have to deal with this problem because they would have uh, twisted the industry's arm starting in the 1990s when they first started finding problems around cell phones. And the industry would have been forced to go to market with a safer product. And then the next year, we could have twisted twisted their arms even further and say, no, now you're going to drop radiation by 200% this year. And then you're going to drop it by a million fold. And they would have found solutions to do so. I think so because the engineers that are coming up with the iPhone, I have one in my in my hand. And of course, it's on airplane mode to remove the radiation but i mean this thing is a marvel of technology the camera here is 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 better than any high end camera where you could purchase in in the 2000s and and the hard drive is probably way stronger than the first computer i had which was a a desktop computer with like a few gigs of uh uh, of hard drive space. I mean, this is this is incredible what we can create when you put multiple people who are extremely creative engineers together. And I think I think we could we could technically have safer products. But what happens in reality when it comes to EMFs is that you have, for example, in in the U.S., you have the FCC, the F- the Federal Communication Commissions, and well, the Harvard Center for Ethics a few years back has called it a captured uh, agency by Big Wireless. There's an entire report, multiple pages long, and it's it's I mean it's someone from Harvard saying that it's probably true. And obviously, they have uh, they, even the government itself is is pretty much in it for the money. Unfortunately, because they're selling the spectrum, they are they are the ones cashing in billions and billions and billions and billions from the telecom companies who are let's say uh, reserving like uh, oh I I call dibs on on the two point seven gigahertz until two point eight gigahertz, and then Verizon has paid for this frequency value and they are the ones who can use it. And this is how it works. It's called the spectrum auction. And the government is in it because they, they make 
they make a lot of money. So how can they be independent? That's uh, uh, really there's a there's a, there's a huge problem of of not, that's not even conflict of interest. I feel like the entire in, like the entire regulatory uh, the the way the regulations were made were just. I don't know, like <laughs> it's built in, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Make sense. And on, on an international standpoint, you have uh, a, a one agency that's called uh, ICNRP, the, um, the International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. And that's, uh, that's a very interesting group because they are supposed to be independent, but they are self, uh, self-appointed self experts. So in other words, if someone leaves the committee, uh, the committee will hire someone else. And so no one that's 100% independent with other ideas about the science or other interpretations of the science can get in. And this group alone is responsible for basically changing or actually every almost every country in the world relies on ICNRP to set their safety standards. But guess what happened, Paul, a few few months back in just February, a, a group of inv- investigative journalists from Europe that's called Investigate Europe, among the best of the best, I think from 10 to 12 countries, they, they've revealed that ICNRP is part of what they called an industry influence cartel created by ICNRP and all the agencies in the world and all the companies. And they even have this kind of a, uh, you know, the, the connect the dots map where we would have pins and little wires uh, and, and th- this, this kind of crazy detective on the entire wall working on it for decades. That, this is what they did. It's, it's all online and they showed the links between the people, the revolving door between ICNRP and top telecoms and tech giants and reg- regulatory agencies. So people are telling me, Nick, are you saying it's it's all a big conspiracy? Well, <laughs> it's just people who want to make a bunch of money and uh, do all they can to do so. And that's called how how corporations have a strong influence on agencies who are supposed to protect us. So when it comes to EMFs, that's that's a whole background. I guess that's that's a long winded answer, but it's important to understand these things because if you still believe that science is clean, that our agencies are uh, uh, have our best interests in mind and have not been uh, tainted by the industry, well, you're in it for trouble because you're you're always be caught off guard, like you mentioned, uh, for on on all health topics and uh, almost all societal topics these days. Because the reality is that corporations do have a very very strong influence. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, the podcast I have out right this minute is with Dave Murf- Murphy, the founder of Food Democracy Now. And uh, they've been involved in successfully suing Monsanto, and, and the whole podcast exposes this kind of stuff with Roundup, which has glyphosate in it. But Dave mm-hmm. spent his whole life in the political system, and he makes it dead clear that we have uh, far more corporate entities in uh, the political system than we do politicians working for the people and outlines extremely the, the extreme dangers of this and how uh, you know that's led to wiping out farming. Uh, small family farms are just being wiped out. But the point only being is that, as I've said many times, we don't have a government anymore. We have a corporate headquarters, and we really don't have a democracy. Uh, if we had a democracy, then a lot of things would be very, very different than they are. But you can see... When people like Sherry Tenpenny and many other people with websites, and, and you're even at risk of this, uh, are having their websites hacked and shut down and then targeted by um, paid uh, skeptics that are paid by large corporations to produce counter information that is usually bogus just to shift the public's opinion. Uh, you see we have a very complex issue, but the, the, for me, as a guy who's been involved in ev- everything to do with health at every level for his whole life, I, I, I'll tell you what, what this means to me. Whenever my students come to me, which is frequently, with an issue and say, Paul, I don't know what is true. I've looked at the information on, let's call it whey protein. 
And there's guys like you on one side telling about the dangers, but then there's a whole pile of PhDs and experts on the other side saying how great it is for you. And then there's people that says organics no better for you than commercial. But then there's guys like you that say it's way better than commercial. I don't know who to believe anymore. Well, we're, we're in this situation where we have so much information on either side of, of such a myriad of issues that are very, very important now. And what I tell my students is, that's you being called out of childhood into adulthood, where you actually have to do the due diligence to carefully read the information and the research on both sides and make up your own opinion based on your own logic, common sense, and the knowledge that you've gained and the experiences that you're having. What is your body telling you? And as you and I had discussed on an Instagram live before, I have a very bad neck injury and, and would roll over so many times at night that I would wear sh holes through sheets in a couple of months. And I would be waking up with my arm completely numb and, and paralyzed from the problems. And one day it just dawned on me uh, why I was so slow to think about this. I don't know, but it's just one of those situations where life is just so full on. But I said to Penny, I'm wondering how much of an influence our wireless system might be having on the pain in my neck. Could you please shut it off tonight before we go to bed? That was the first night since I'd hurt my neck that I was able to sleep through the entire night and did not wake up with numbness in my arm and my fingers. And there was no pain waking me up at night. And I woke up feeling the most rested I felt in years. And so the point that I'm making is I had to do my own research. And because I was already in pain, I was able to have an objective measure within myself. In other words, I became the actual testing instrument. And just shutting that wireless system off made such a radical difference that now I've actually got the ability to feel very easily when there's a wireless system on because it causes the, the base vibration of my body to rise up, which I'm sensitive to from so many years of Tai Chi, Qigong, and shamanic practice and meditation and all that. But do you see the point I'm making? When we're, when, when we're facing these very large, massive, global, shall we say, circumstances with drugs, with food, with things like chlorine and water and mercury and teeth and uh, farming chemicals and Roundup and GMOs and additives, preservatives and supplements and x-rays and MRIs and, you know, you name it, that we're being bombarded. But if people just stay passive, they don't realize much of the money they're spending on health problems is actually a byproduct of living in an environment that is not compatible for human beings. So. Part of the reason for the podcast is to give people the awareness and hopefully the inspiration to start paying attention. And a very simple thing that you can do is start shutting your wireless off at night and see how it affects your body and your sleep quality. Um, start using EMF protection gadgets, which we'll, we'll get into in a bit here. But do you see what I'm sharing, Nick, how these situations force us into adulthood where we have to start looking at the evidence and making choices for ourselves, or we're always a victim to something that we can't identify. You know, it's like the old saying, the devil's favorite place to hide is in the church because no one thinks to look there, but the devil's hiding inside of our bodies and the corporations uh, aren't going to spend the money to look there for fear of all the things we've just discussed. This is true, and uh, at some point, you, you there's there's only so so many benefits that uh, reading on the internet can provide. <laughs> it's a simple way to put it, I think, because some people will will get stuck, kind of reading about EMS, reading, and oh, I don't know who to believe. Okay, well, do the test, right? So for yourself, if you change the way you use technology and reduce your EMF load, do you feel different? And that's not the only test because uh, science does show that we're all affected whether we feel it or not. But the thing is, I I, I went to uh, to rent a car at, at budget a few months back and I, I told the clerk about my work and my book and uh, 
she told me, okay, well, what should I do about it? And I said, okay, well, for for three nights, uh, do do the simple test. Just turn off your your cell phone or hit uh, airplane mode. Remove anything wireless from your from your uh, bedroom, and then turn off the Wi-Fi router at night. And I didn't think really it would do anything for her necessarily, but uh, a few months later, I went to rent a car at the exact same place, and she said, "Hey, you know what? My husband, uh, we we did we did what you you just the the low EMF, let's say the low EMF bedroom test for a couple of nights, and my husband on the first night started sleeping through the night without waking up and having to pee for the first time in twenty years. Yes, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that's that's not." Everyone is going to feel that, but his husband did not feel like someone, let's say that quote unquote EMF sensitive necessarily. He, he, he didn't believe any of these things. So there's no really, there's no like placebo effect or any, uh, I don't know if they even talked about it, but they just, his body knew because obviously EMFs can impact your sleep. And if you just do the test for yourself, I'd say the large majority, that's a safe statement of people who turn off their Wi-Fi at night, their cell phone, remove anything, Bluetooth, wireless from your bedroom, will sleep more soundly. And if you want to track it, I do have the uh, the Oura Ring that I use and I see a difference in different uh, environments. I, I slept in a hotel room in Las Vegas. My, my sleep was horrible. Uh, obviously, this is multifactorial, but I could also verify that the EMFs were off the charts in Vegas because I do have the EMF instrumentation, the meters to also know what the environment is like. So you, you can test it out for yourself, but there there's... Uh, Theory will get you to a point, and then practice is another thing. And when it comes, also, Paul, I, I must say, like the theory was okay for me to understand. Okay, yes, probably EMS are nothing good. I should talk about it. But what really made the difference for me is the physicians who are seeing people get better when they reduce their EMF load. Now I was hooked because this is real life. This is not theory. This is not a study or an argument online. For example, one such uh, physician is Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt, who has 45 years of medical experience or, or, or more. I'm and, familiar uh, with him. He's, he's highly yeah, credible. Somebody highly I highly credible. Respect. Exactly. He's an MD, PhD. He, uh, he has a practice. He's practicing in three different countries, in Germany, Switzerland, and in uh, the U.S., in the Washington state at the Sofia Health Institute, and he's recognized among its, its peers and in functional medicine as someone who's really cutting edge and a pioneer in the treatment of chronic disease. So he's seeing people with uh, autism, stage four cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or two immunity, chronic fatigue, and things that are, w- just won't go away. And when he told, he, he told me this in an interview as I was starting to build my course in early 2018, and it really changed everything for me because I, you know, I, I wrote a book on the topic and I thought I was I didn't know really where it would lead me. Like, am I done with the topic? Will I switch to something else? Talking about, I don't know, sleep quality, biohacking. I had other interests in mind. But when he told me that, he told me, Nick, uh, the average patient that I see has seen more than 20 other health practitioners before me. And sometimes mainstream medicine ones, sometimes holistic ones. And the number one thing that all the other guys who have seen this patient that's still sick are missing is reducing EMF load. And he told me there's like uh, my patient population who is reducing EMF load and they get better. And the ones that don't get better is because they don't listen to my very simple advice to kind of start cleaning out the environment. And I said, wow, okay, if this guy is saying it, it's probably true. And it, obviously this is, he's seeing the, the sickest people on the planet. So uh, how can we, like, what kind of action do we need to take as a preventative measure? It's it's unclear, but it, it's a message that's very important. It, the message is, if you create a normal ancestral background levels of man-made EMFs, you heal, let's say, quote unquote, normally just as our ancestors used to. And if you create very high levels of EMFs, you have a disruption of normal physiology and hence a disruption of normal healing, normal sleep and normal functioning. So it's just uh, at, a, at a very high level, it just makes sense. 
But this proved to me that, okay, it's real and that doctors seeing actual people are, are not necessarily spending their time on arguments about, oh, is it, is it a thing? Is it not a thing? What are the mechanisms? They don't care. They just want to get people better. So they test it. Te- they test the, their assumptions with people and they quickly discover once they start getting into this world that if you reduce the cell phone exposure, if you reduce the Wi-Fi at night, if you even go further and uh, shield the environment and create an extremely low EMF environment, you see an improvement across the board, whether the person feels sensitive or not. Well, the other thing that's interesting too is if you go completely the other way, which uh, has been done many times, and you put people inside of a Faraday cage and you block them even from the natural EMFs in our environment, that produces all sorts of health challenges and even mental emotional problems. Are you familiar with that research? Yes. Um, I, I don't remember the researchers, but I, I know there's been uh, NASA research and also uh, other types of research where people got put in, in, into a, a bunker deep into the ground, but it was actually all shielded against magnetic fields. So there was no, they didn't have initially like the, the entrainment effect, uh, the circuit and rhythm effect of the Schumann resonance, and they got right. very sick. They yeah. wanted to study how closely our human biology is related or is uh, let's say, linked to how the planet functions because they wanted to send people into space where you don't have these characteristics. Uh, And and I think it also led uh, NASA to look at um, different technologies of uh, pulsed electromagnetic fields that are beneficial that could uh, try try and reproduce this normal uh, uh, 7.83 hertz of that the Earth produces. And can you bring that into space to kind of trick your body into thinking you're still on Earth? And that's this is the future of trying to live on other planets is probably trying to emulate what we have here because it's, it, it evolved at the same time as human biology. But I, I am familiar with that. And um, if you lived in, in a Faraday cage, uh, let's say that, is blocking uh, microwave radiation, you wouldn't initially have this problem because the Schumann resonance still goes through the Faraday cage. Uh, From what my understanding is, it is a concern though that um, if you if you block everything, are you impairing your health? Like exactly, and we don't know. We don't know exactly what, what the deal is, but I, I can tell you that on a, on a healing standpoint, for example, Dr. Klinghart says if you have someone that's chronically ill, they need to block uh, the outside man-made EMFs from cell phone towers and other environmental EMFs as much as they can. So sometimes this includes using like an EMF blocking paint in an entire room and a room so shielded that you would try to have si- uh, cell phone signal inside and you would get zero bar. Basically, you're shielded from the outside environment, but this would not necessarily mean that your body isn't having the Schumann resonance uh, because magnetic fields tend to go, uh, basically they go through everything, right. especially at the, at this very low frequency. Yes. Uh, I think I mentioned to you before, I've been down this road with clients. In fact, one of my clients uh, who's been coaching with me for quite a long time and is, is very devoted to his healing work and spiritual growth and development uh, and he's quite a successful man. He had bought a penthouse in downtown Manhattan. And when he moved in, him and his wife and children began having uh, a variety of health problems. And my immediate intuition based on the symptoms was those are all things that are common for excessive EMF exposure. Have you done any research to see if there's any cell phone towers near you? And he hadn't thought of this before he bought this place so then he started doing some research on the internet and he found out that the building directly across the street he could actually stand outside on his balcony and look across the street and there was a cell phone tower right there yeah so so he had a a bow biologist come to his house to assess it and he had i think 2600 times the safe level of emf pollution moving through his house and ultimately had to spend almost a million dollars to put specialized paints on the walls, uh, wire framing in the floors. They had to set up a, a, a network outside on the patio to protect the kids out there. Um, so he, like I said, he spent almost a million dollars to EMF protect his 
uh, penthouse, and it was so effective that his cell phone barely worked in there. So, um, you know, the, these are very real things when people start looking into them. And the, and the key issue is, is, is that their health challenges that were related to these issues cleared up. One of the things, I, before I move on to some other questions, I'd like you to overview because I'm sort of setting you up to make a point here. Could you give us an overview on how it is that the EMFs caused a general increase in, in inflammation in the body? Because that's exactly what I was experiencing, and that's why my neck pain went away so much, is that I was able to decrease inflammation in my body. So could you just, in your own way, share how is it these frequencies as they move through our body and, and enter into the water in our bodies, which is such a massive conductor system, are triggering global inflammation? Sure. Well, it's exactly the mechanisms we, we talked about when it comes to intracellular calcium increase. The downstream effects of that is a lot of oxidative damage and an increase. It's, re, um, it's, it's what uh, Dr. Paul has also studied, uh, what's called the no ono cycle, the nitric oxide peroxynitride cycle. And it clearly shows that when you have increased intracellular calcium, of course, you have uh, you can have DNA breaks, oxidative damage. You have a reduction in uh, mitochondrial function, so low energy. But it's a self-perpetuating cycle that also stimulates uh, uh, interleukin six, interleukin eight, interleukin mm -hmm. ten, and, and different. Uh, let's say it stimulates just overall inflammation creation on a cellular level. And this is something that becomes chronic and also self-perpetuating. So one of the problem is, and, and some people tell me that, they, they, they say, well, Nick, how do we know that uh, a cell phone EMF is not hormetic stress. Hormetic stress, which is just like exercise. You exercise, you break down muscles, and then you recover and you get benefits because so so breaking down something in that case has benefits if you can recuperate. The problem with EMS is that, uh, or like from your cell phone or just ambient electropollution, is that there's no stop. There's right. no recovery there's no, there's, window. There's no, there's no anabolic cycle. It's all no. catabolic. Exactly. So it is just a, a destructive cycle, and something something actually that I, I'm just uh, thinking about that that I I don't think I shared publicly is uh, um, a scientist called uh, Ole Johansson from Sweden uh, is a uh, has published around six hundred something peer reviewed papers in his career from the Karolinska Institute, one of the top. Uh, scientific, uh, let's say, places to publish studies in the world. And uh, he uh, shared with me that um, scientists in the last decades have found that the baseline, um, let's say, what is it, is the, is the histamine levels in blood uh, in the entire population, it, it used to be next to zero. And eventually it became uh, a low baseline level. So they had to raise what they consider a histamine reaction and what they consider a non-reaction. And they have been slowly but surely gradu like gradually increasing what is considered a reaction because everyone has a histamine reaction. And one of the reason might be food, but one other reason might be EMS because he, he did an interesting test and it was back in the uh, 1990s, if I'm not mistaken. And he put uh, students who really didn't know what, uh, what the study was all about just in a room and they had to stand with uh, a computer a screen facing their back. So the computer screen was not emitting Wi-Fi at the time, obviously it was not around, but it was uh, other types of EMF, so just electricity and exposure and possibly even uh, UV radiation for these old displays. And what he found is that even if pe if people couldn't feel the EMFs at all, they basically, he, he told me, Nick, the only thing they felt is boredom because they had to sit straight for, or, or sit there in, a, in an empty room for four hours. Uh, they're, they're, their mast cells were migrating at the surface of their skin, just like just like if you had uh, an acute reaction to something kind of irritating your skin, and their histamine also went up in the blood. So that's that's another way that is creating inflammation. Is it that your entire body kind of 
thinks uh, as EMFs as a, as a type of allergen, it, it's triggering many systems, you know, but the, and we don't know to, to what extent and what all, like probably all systems in the human body are affected because this is electricity. But uh, overall, this is how it contributes to inflammation. It might be true histamine. It might be true uh, the loss of function of the different uh, endogenous systems that are controlling inflammation. So for example, uh, we see in in many, many studies, people who live closer to a cell phone tower have uh, lower uh, glutathione levels. Uh, They have a lower antioxidant status that that would have helped uh, mitigate inflammation a little bit the way I understand it without being, uh, of course, a physician. I don't know all the biology, but so, so it's, it's also our internal capacity to lower this inflammation that goes down if only through uh, a poor sleep quality, right? So inflammation control, I'm sure if you have, uh, if your, your sleep quality goes down, your deep sleep or REM sleep goes down, I'm sure that inflammation goes up. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's you don't have time to clear it. You can't stay parasympathetic, which links to the immune system. Exactly. Once, you're, once you're sympathetic, you shut all that down. It's, uh, it's you know, there's so so much going on. I, it's, I feel like I have a thousand things that I want to say. But what I was asking you that question for was to lead to another point. And the point is, is that when you look at how much heavy metals, I mean, I've been a therapist for a long time and using functional medicine tests, it's very rare to not find someone with high levels of mercury or aluminum or copper or nickel or iron in their body. And when you look at how many people today have high levels of mercury and mercury in fillings, and then you look at the fact that the current research shows that vaccinations are loaded with mercury and aluminum. All of those things are very, very powerful conductors of, of electromagnetic energy, aren't they? Yeah, there's there's indications. We don't know exactly the 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 mechanisms there in science, but there's observations that there's a very strong synergy between certain environmental toxins. Uh, one of them being different types of heavy metals and EMFs. And and over and over, you have uh, patients that come in who are, let's say, EMF sensitive. I don't like that term that much because it kind of sounds like an allergy, but let's say they get more symptoms than uh, the neighbor compared to the same exposure. And and usually you will find that they have a, a, a very high heavy metal load. And there's also interesting studies showing that just talking on a cell phone or even just being exposed to Wi-Fi might increase uh, the the rate of degradation of your uh, mercury fillings. And they actually will start leaching more heavy metals uh, and, and your body possibly absorbing more, especially your brain. So uh, again, we don't know to what extent, but this is there. There's an entire group of researchers looking at just the, this link and 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 how it, it might affect uh, mercury safety. And of course, mercury safety. Uh, here's a hint: it's not safe. So we shouldn't like. <laughs> at, at I mean, any dose. <laughs> no. Well, that's what uh, that's what I'm hearing from toxicologists. So, in other words, remove mercury from your mouth safely using a holistic de- de- dentistry. Uh, that that's a step, and and for some people, um, uh, cer- certain physicians have told me, Nick, uh, I see people who are suffering from EMF related symptoms. They cannot hold a cell phone. They get headaches. They they feel horrible in a city. And once they get their heavy metal uh, load down and and address other stressors in their life, then they can handle normal life a little bit more. Uh, normal electrosmog exposure. So there's a strong correlation between a body burden of different chemicals and stressors and let's say uh, your body always being in fight or flight mode and how sensitive you might feel to different sources. So that that's also something that is seen in, in, in medical science. Yes. Well, as I, w- what I was really pointing out there is the fact that the more metal a person has in their body, the more shall we say, acutely electrifiable they are because they're becoming a better and better conductor of electromagnetic frequencies. So, uh, you know, that should be fairly straightforward. Water is already a conductor, but it's not nearly as potent as any kind of a metal. And I 
shared with you, and I'll share it again because uh, our our little um, live, I think it was YouTube live or whatever we did, Instagram live, uh, what, maybe a year or so ago. But in my travels around the world, I, I'd identified that belly button rings were commonly connected to inflammation and dysfunction in the core of, of a person's ability to activate what's called the inner unit or the transverse abdominus, pelvic floor, diaphragm, and deep spinal stabilizers, which are the key stabilizing system of the axial skeleton. And I have done many, many demonstrations on stage where I would say who of you in the room uh, speaking to the women has, and I would speak to the women because they're the ones that tend to wear the belly button rings, has low back pain or any kind of SI joint or pelvic girdle dysfunction you're having a hard time with. And then, you know, (laughs) in a class of 200 people, 75 hands would go up. And then I would say, okay, if you just raise your hand and you have a belly button ring, stand up. And then, you know, there'd usually be 50 females in there. So I'd bring them up on stage, test their core, exactly how I teach my students to test it, and everybody in the audience can see it, and the person I'm working with can feel it. And then I would say, okay, now please remove your belly button ring. And without any therapy whatsoever, I'd repeat the same tests, and nine times out of ten, their core function returned to normal as quick as they could get that belly button ring out of there and put it on the floor. And that would shock the hell out of them. And I could even show that their gait had changed because their body was stabilizing or various other factors that we can test through movement. Then That's incredible. uh, Yeah. yeah, uh, On occasion, I would have them put the belly button ring back in. And sure enough, just from the time it takes to stick it back in their body and me start doing the tests again, everything was shutting off again. And I think that's more powerful than theory right there. I mean, what else do you need to athletes have more respect over, oh, wait a minute, what is it, like, what are these new practices uh, doing to my physiology? And and, and what, maybe the belly button wasn't much of a problem when we didn't have this ambient electrosmog, I I can tell, but there's good indication, like you said, a a heavy metal load and then any metal that you put on your body could also uh, conduct EMS. And I've seen studies, for example, with uh, where people with uh, their glasses are metal framed and yeah. they get a higher exposure to the head and to the eyes. Well, it's probably from ambient levels of EMS as well. So thinking about any metal that you have on your body, uh, we don't know to what extent, but sh- sure thing, it is affecting how your body is picking up this electricity as well. And when you when you you talked about heavy metal load, it's important to say that uh, well, yes, the 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 kind of the body impedance, like its its conductivity, will vary uh, will vary from individual to individual. And and I think that's part of the reason that we each. Uh, have a different reaction also so some some people might be uh for somehow the is it because of their fat mass is it because of their hydration status uh uh um I don't know, like lean body mass, uh, how how large they are, how, how are their height. There's a lot of different factors that make it so that we're not affected the same. And sometimes people use that to say, well, I'm not affected, so you shouldn't be. Well, I don't think it works this way, especially with electricity. So it's really um, individual more sensitivity does exist to certain people are just hypersensitive and some other people could say, well, I can hold a a thousand cell phones on my head. I don't feel anything. Well, good for you, but that might just mean you're dead already. (laughs) (laughs) At the same time, you should preventively uh, preventively not do that. (laughs) Honestly. Well, that brings up a comment. A lot of my students, for example, I do tests in class when I'm teaching and I'll say, okay, pull out a cell phone, I'll take someone up in front of the class and just do a standard deltoid muscle test on them just to get a baseline level of strength on them. Then I just have somebody hand them a cell phone that's turned on and I've never seen a human being in my entire life that didn't just go noticeably weak as soon as they held on to a live cell phone because it's causing stress on the body so it shuts the body's capacity to generate force down. Uh, simply because stress summates in the body. So if you load any muscle or joint complex, you're stressing it. But if you add a global stressor like a cell phone, well, the body end up, uh, it basically goes into a protective reaction and can't 
effectively stabilize the body with that much um, stress load on it. So it's a simple way to test it. But the point I'm leading to is many of my students coming in, you know, they're coming into HLC2 for these particular classes. They haven't uh, really, unfortunately, done as good a job at implementing the HLC1 strategies with themselves. So many of them are still in the intellectual stage and flirting with the ideas, but they haven't embraced the changes. And so what I tell them is I say, if, if you want a test you can do on yourself to see if your subtle energy systems are clogged up, your ability to feel subtle energy, such as the ability to feel a cell phone. I mean, for me, when I even get within two and a half feet or three feet of my cell phone, I can feel my whole body starting to buzz like an agitated buzz. And so I tell them, if you just take Bach flower rescue remedy and put four drops under your tongue, and if you do not feel an energetic shift in your body when that fluid drops into your mouth, you can pretty much rest assured that your subtle energy pathways are clogged up. And that's where breathing exercises, stretching, changing all, basically all diet and lifestyle factors, but unblocking mechanical obstructions in the body. Um, and doing mental emotional work because a lot of people have so much negative emotion in them that they're winding themselves up worse than the cell phones that they're trying to hold on to to test uh, would do anyhow. Uh, so there's a simple test I developed for my students because I found anybody that's, shall we say, healthy in their subtle energy system, which is to, to be able to feel things that are at lower levels than we might perceive we could feel. Um, they can do that test and then they realize that they need to do some cleaning. And I've had countless students take my suggestions for cleaning themselves out and doing some of the healing work and, and then call me up six months later and say, wow, now when I put rescue remedy in my mouth, I feel it very, very strongly. I said, well, congratulations. Um, the, the, uh, the, there was another thing I wanted to share about this, and that is I told you about this, but I want to share it on this podcast because this is reaching a lot more people. A friend of mine came to me and, and he had had a, a quite a heart problem emerge. And I can't remember if he had to have heart surgery or not, but he had cardiac affibrillation, you know, where the heart all of a sudden loses mm -hmm. its normal rhythm and starts bouncing around in your chest and can one minute be racing and then slow down a lot. And he had been seeing a doctor for this, and he came over to visit me one day, and he has a habit, at the time he had a habit of wearing this big, thick gold chain, kind of like, you know, Mr. T wears all those gold chains, but this, this guy's a doctor and a healer, and he was wearing this pendant, I think it was probably the flower of life, it was something beautiful to look at, but it was gold, it was, you know, high-end gold necklace, and I said to him, I highly recommend you get that gold necklace off and stop wearing a watch because those things are all very strong antennas for electromagnetic pollution. And the pendant on his necklace was sitting right directly in the region of his heart, right above his uh, thymus gland, which is part of our immune system. And so he took the uh, necklace off. And then I got in touch with him a few days later and I said, do you notice any difference having the necklace off? And he's like, oh my God, it's night and day. He said, thank you so much for telling me that. And, and he hasn't put the necklace on since because he found that if he puts it back on, sure enough, he starts having more uh, reoccurrence of his affibrillation symptoms. And I've worked with countless numbers of my students to get metal off their body uh, because they were able to identify that it was actually a stress factor. One of the, the things, though, that's come up for me as we're talking, I'd like to dialogue with you for a minute on is, you know, Masaru Emoto, you're familiar with Emoto, I would imagine. Yes. Well, he used to actually have a business. A part of his work was to go into large corporations and do screening for EMF pollution. And he would do huh. individual surveys on each of the people in there, and then he would test the environment. But he said something very interesting in a lecture that I attended with him. Fortunately, I got to see him before he died. But uh, in his lecture, he made a very interesting statement. He said that in his, all of his years of working with EMF pollution, he found an interesting correlation. It had a very, very negative effect 
on people in buildings except people who were happy with their life and loved what they were doing. He said when those people with a positive mindset were tested, they showed little to no negative physiological response to EMF pollution, while the person right next to them who may not be happy at home or like their job was having significant negative effects. So isn't it interesting that if our mindset is positive and we live what I call a dream affirmative life, and we take responsibility for creating happiness in our day and giving ourselves the space we need to love ourselves and nurture ourselves enough that we really have something to share with others, the the capacity for us to handle more stress of any type seems to be significant enough that people can actually be far less damaged by EMF environments because their capacity to heal is greater. I just found that such an interesting and very truly holistic observation. That's uh, that's tremendous. Yeah, and some people, I think, like, I agree with that. At the same time, sometimes I think that some people push the envelope a little bit and some, I don't know, like there's just, uh, I'm a very down to earth guy. You know, you, you know me, Paul, anyway, but uh, some people have, uh, have told me, Nick, I just have to think that EMS are perfectly fine and everything will be fine. I'm not convinced by that, but I, I'll just take the precaution and, and use my cell phone less. But that being said, some people have a reaction when they even when they hear me so sometimes I, uh, I feel a little bit of guilt around that i'm like well yeah i need to moderate my message and also tell people that well you don't want to start fearing your environment and and looking at cell phone towers being extremely in, in fight or flight because this is another way you're going to poison your body and, and and sometimes maybe your reaction to the emfs is worse than the emfs themselves we don't know but thinking that oh there's radiation around me the world is a is a scary place that's a sure far away to have poor health and, and mentally and then physically because both are are so uh, intertwined so it's very important that you you stay um, rational and sane and, and calm about when you hear this con- these conversations because sure sure thing it, it can sound like a topic that that's let's face it overwhelming at first you're like oh there's nothing I can do there's 50 Wi-Fi signals when I connect my computer I see my neighbors are blasting me with EMS there's EMS everywhere but my message is well sure there are EMS everywhere however reducing your own exposure is relatively simple because it starts by the devices that are closer to your body. So your Wi-Fi router, for example, will affect you more, generally speaking, than the one from your neighbor, depending on where it is. Your own cell phone will affect you more because it's on your body all day, every day, and maybe you talk on it several hours, then even the cell phone of your neighbors on a subway train because it's closer and, and right. the radiation, the, the effects will drop off exponentially as you create distance. So it's important to feel empowered about the topic and not let yourself um, stay in that in that initial shock too much because it's true that how you how you face the the issue might be extremely de- detrimental to your own physiology. And to be quite honest, it happened with me for a while. <laughs> I think my first year talking about EMS was uh, me being more affected, becoming more negative, becoming more fearful of my environment. And as I became, uh, I became myself. My I don't know. I, I was extremely exhausted that summer of 2017, and. I felt more sensitive. And when I feel more sensitive, I feel more fearful. Like, okay, well, if we go in that place, will I feel okay? And if we, uh, even even traveling uh, this year, at the end of the year, I felt super exhausted and I felt very sensitive to Wi-Fi and I felt horrible in coffee shops. And next thing I I was thinking about when uh, Jen and I had travel plans for this winter, I thought about, I told her, well, Jen, I don't know if that's such a good idea. What if we rent an Airbnb and there's a Wi-Fi router and I cannot turn it off? Instead of being focused on, it's awesome, we're going to travel. So <laughs> my my mindset played a huge difference in myself also. And I had to to compose with it. But I guess it, it's also a matter of any 
anything detrimental to your life, right? If it's if you hear about glyphosate being spread everywhere, are you afraid when you take a bite of food, right? It's the same thing could be said for various toxins and 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 let's say topics that are unfortunately kind of doom and gloom. Yeah, I'm by no means saying that the positive thought is going to alter the effects of the EMF on your body. Uh, I think you'd have to be a very advanced yogi that had meditated in caves <laughs> for about 10 years to approach that level of ability. I'm simply <laughs> saying that my interpretation of Emoto's observation is that a happy person is in a state of harmony yeah. at a psychological level, which is the greatest influence we have on our physiology. And the greater the stability in your mindset, the more capacity you have to heal from anything. And we look at mountains of information on healing disease. And what's the first thing you find when you start studying a lot of information on spontaneous cures from diseases? It's all, it always is coupled with a change in mindset. So yeah. I just want to make that clarification. I'm not by any means trying to say that you know, be, being happy and ignoring EMFs or mercury or Roundup <laughs> is, is, is going to make them go away. But there's also a limit to what we can do with mindset because the body is still a physiological system that is frequency-based and has its normal operational ranges without which it goes into a state of disease. There's a saying that you made me remember that really relates to sort of the whole situation of the world right now. And I don't remember who the author of the saying is, but it, and I'm paraphrasing, the saying goes, have the strength to do what you can and the courage to face what you can't change. Very powerful. And I think that's it. You know, we really have to have the strength to do what we can to improve our health and to make our voice be heard about these issues. But we also have to have the courage to face the things in life that we can't change. And each of us has to decide um, what, based on our belief system, what are the things that we can't change? Well, we can't change the weather. And we, uh, well, you, you could if you were advanced enough. That's another story. Uh, there, there, <laughs> there are shaman that have been demonstrated to be able to create rain in, in desert places but again that's a lot of meditation in a cave but you see my point is is some of the things like a lot of people would think they can't change emf pollution but if we get together well the italian people got together and were so disappointed with the government policies and the forced vaccinations that they ultimately shut the government down kicked everybody out and elected in a new government so you can see that if enough people get together as a democracy to share their opinions and to make it known that the people really are the government, not the corporations. I mean, we could put any one of these corporations out of business. if We just stopped buying their products for a, a, a period enough time that would bring them to their knees. So ultimately people do have tremendous amounts of power, but they, the, one of the paradoxes is the very technology that we're talking about, such as internet and phones turns out to be, in my opinion, the medicine that we can use to create the connection and the consciousness and get the group um, and moral and emotional support from each other we need to stand up, be heard, uh, make the changes we need to make on a personal level, but then do the things we've got to do to collectively to let corporations know we're not going to just lay over and play dead while they uh, profit on our uh, our own progressive destruction and that of the planet. because. One of the things we haven't even talked about at all, which I don't think we need to go into too deep just because we're getting fairly late in the show here, is that all the things that we're talking about that affect human beings affect every living creature in nature, from the microorganisms to the bees to the birds to the trees to the plants to the animals. So, um, you know, I remember when they started testing that system that the Navy had developed called HARP, where they were using frequencies under the water and it started causing dolphins and whales to beach themselves dead all over the world so the military has been experimenting with various underwater technologies for defense purposes and various things like that and they already had plenty of evidence that they can destroy uh nature but as as we know these things are usually swept under the rug one of the questions i wanted to ask you is 
Can you give us an overview of where you have seen what I would call bad science relative to legitimate science regarding the dangers of EMF? Have you looked at scientific studies and maybe they said this is not dangerous, which we know there's tons of them out there, or you wouldn't be having this conversation with me. What have you seen in the structure of research that's not telling us what we would call the truth about EMFs versus such as uh, science produced by corporations? That's always an issue. Uh, in other words, drug companies doing their own research is, is not a very good, reliable way to look at research. But if you, if you were to say there's these characteristics make bad science and these characteristics make good science. Have you looked at the correlation there? Sure. Uh, I, I think that good science is independently funded. And that's probably not a fair assessment because sometimes you can have uh, government or industry funding and have tremendously good studies. But it's it's let's say, let me put it another way. It's obvious that when the industry is involved in funding, they found uh, fewer effects. And this is just like, this has been an, an observation again and again in the EMF space. And it has been an observation in uh, big pharma and in big tobacco. I mean, when the industry is involved, obviously the, the bias can be felt throughout science and throughout the entire process from choosing what to study to the study design, to the, the way the study is interpreted, interpreted and even uh, which scientists that, let's say, have been shown that uh, have, have demonstrated themselves that they're a little bit, uh, they, they believe, for example, a scientist who believe EMFs are not an issue will be hired by in the industry to create a study which shows that EMFs are not an issue. So the bias in choosing who to work with also, obviously. Um, and there's something, uh, there, there are various databases uh, and, and scientific reviews uh, that have shown that, uh, generally speaking, the funding sources will greatly impact the outcomes. And one, one such... Uh, uh, independent uh, nonprofit that has looked at uh, exactly this phenomenon is uh, the Oce Oceania uh, Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association, uh, ORSA. And they looked at uh, around 2,400 peer-reviewed papers that have been published on EMF since the year 2000. So that's a lot. There, we, we're probably now up to almost 3,000 peer-reviewed papers on EMFs. And you have 61% that showed biological effects and 26% that showed no effect. So, and, and also part of these 26% who did not show effect, it was almost 100% of those are financed by the telecoms or military industries that, again, military usually they want to find no effect because they use so many EMF-related technologies in uh, their military personnel. They have radar, they have sensors of all kinds uh, in, in their tanks and in everything. Every vehicle, every soldier is equipped with multiple things that emit EMF. So they want to show no effect. And what was even more interesting than that is uh, our, uh, the, the, the study of how these how are EMFs being studied in the first place? And uh, one researcher that's from Greece, uh, Dimitri Panagopoulos, uh, has found in 2017, he, he looked at, okay, well, what happens if you use a signal generator uh, in, in a study versus a real mobile phone? And to, to give you some quick background, because I know we're pressed on time here, is that most studies use a simulated exposure instead of a real cell phone. So they go in a lab and they don't use a real mobile device. They don't purchase an iPhone 7 and put it there and connect it to uh, the, the wireless network and see what happens. They will instead use a machine that is supposed to emulate a cell phone signal. So the same frequency, for example. Well, you found that when they use signal generators, you have 50% of studies that show effect and 50 who don't. So the, the people looking at these uh, overall in governments and regulators would say, well, it's inconsistent. So we cannot say they're, they're dangerous. But if you use a real mobile phone, 
all the studies, virtually 100% of the studies who used a real device did find biological effects, detrimental biological effects. So what does that show us and how is that possible? Well, the, the simulators are in fact not simulating a real cell phone because a real cell phone has a more, much more hectic way of pulsating the signal of modulating. So it goes super, super high when you connect on a call and then it goes super low and then in the middle and super high. So it's it's a very, very ectic um, signal characteristic that your body is facing compared to an EMF simulator that's in fact not simulating anything at all because a cell phone doesn't act this way. So the bad science, is it created because they want to find no effects? Maybe. Some people would go as far as saying that. And I would I would argue that engineers don't understand biology and they opt for an EMF simulator because they don't understand that when you add pulsation and other, uh, let's say, when you add more chaos, the way a cell phone acts uh, compared to an EMF simulator that is, a, let's say, a more... Uh, a more smooth wave, well, you have different biological effects because, again, the cell gets more and more and more confused by the complexity and and how um, and how bizarre the signal ends up being. And this is what's observed on a biological standpoint is that the more you have a signal that gets even further away from nature when it comes to how quickly it is pulsed. And in nature, you don't, you don't see that. How uh, it's polarized. So it's shaped in a certain form that's completely unnatural. And in nature, you don't have anything that's polarized. It's all unpolarized. So you have uh, an EMF signal that emits in all direction. You don't have a, a special shape to it. So each time you have a man-made intervention to the signals themselves, it causes more biological effects. <laughs> and that's, again, I think only logical. But engineers who want to produce science and the industry hiring them or hiring the scientists, they don't know biology necessarily or biophysics. So they will use EMF simulators and call it a day. So this is really what we're seeing in science is that the engineers working in companies and the scientists need to team up with, well, first they need to be independent, of course, but they need to team up with people who understand the biology and the biophysics of exactly how these EMFs affect our cells. And then uh, we need to test the real thing. So that's just one example. I could Google, we could do an entire episode on just EMF science, but it's just one example that I think is so revealing of how it's easy to miss the boat and not test the right thing. Yes, I, I agree with everything you're saying. And, and you know, I was trained in, in electronics. I used to repair weapon systems on Cobra helicopters, and I spent a year in electronics school. And one of the things is when you're using a signal generator, it's a perfect frequency. It's a clean frequency, exactly that frequency. And when you're dealing with uh, uh, any kind of sending and receiving device, you always have what's called a signal-to-noise ratio. So uh, for example, if you want a very high-end stereo, it's got a very low signal-to-noise ratio, which means it reproduces sound as accurately as possible, and that's why they're so expensive. But we could never afford cell phones that were as pure as frequency generators, so you, you're dealing with a combination or a complex of frequencies, even though it may be calibrated to work within a certain frequency range. So the whole concept is basically like you said it's 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 a design flaw because smart people aren't smart in all the areas they need to be smart in in order to do mm -hmm. research on human beings and you know one of the reasons i mentioned this issue of study design was uh, i'll give you a classic example when i was doing research on organic food i found a research paper from the british uh um the British Soil Association, and the British Soil Association gathered a panel of highly skilled scientists together to evaluate um, the study design on 128 studies because they've g gathered 128 studies looking at the efficacy of organic food versus commercial food. And I can't remember what the percentage was um, at the time, I think, uh, of, a, of 1,230 studies reviewed by 
um, I think it was Virginia Worthingham, if I remember right, there was a 56% uh, tip towards organic and the rest of them were non-organic. And I was shocked when I saw that. I'm like, how in the world could you have, you know, uh, 40, uh, what is it, 44% uh, of people thinking that there was no difference between organic and commercial. So anyhow, the British Soil Association got this panel of scientists together. They looked at the the uh, study design, and they found of 128 studies comparing organic and commercial food, only 28 of them had a, a study design that was considered valid based on what they were trying to research. <laughs> And then 100% of those 28 studies showed significant improvements uh, in the quality of food and the benefits to people's health if they ate organic food. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because whenever when you get into any of these issues like EMFs, vaccination, uh, heavy metal, mercury in teeth, chlorine in water, medical drugs, you always run into this problem that the public gets inundated with so much research that's confusing and, and has contradictory uh, viewpoints like we were discussed. But until someone has the knowledge of this subject to look at the study design, they can't discern the difference between good research and, and bogus research. And I think that that's a real reason why I interview guys like you and why I recommend your book, because you've done the due diligence to look at these things. And uh, you see the same thing, for example, um, one of the, I've had a few, two, two doctors in specific that went through my holistic lifestyle coach training that used to work for drug companies. One of them worked for GlaxoSmithKline. He was a formulator for medical drugs. And what he shared with me, which I, I, I found quite fascinating, was that they develop the drugs on computer models. In other words, they have simulated human physiology in a computer model, which the paradox of that is it means they think everybody's the same physiologically. <laughs> You know, and so inevitably, there's all sorts of drugs that get taken off the market after thousands and thousands of people die, and they go, "Oops, I guess we weren't as right as we thought we were." So it's just the the level of, you know, we're we're we're, we're what I call the smartest dumb people we've ever been. We have rocket science knowledge in one area, but we don't realize that you have to have, you, know, you can know a lot about EMFs and you can be a scientist, but if you don't understand how that correlates to biological living organisms, then you, you can be very sure that you're right, but not realize that you're very wrong. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Now, I know you got to go soon, and, and so do I, and we're holding off a three-year-old lion out here who's desperate to burst into the doors and see Daddy, so Penny's having a hard time keeping him quiet, but... Um, <laughs> The big thing, and we could do a whole show on this, and maybe we can do moving forward, but give us the the synopsis of the 5G phone situation, because I, without using up the time, because I want you to talk, I can tell you I already have my own deep concerns, but uh, give us the kind of the, the uh, Reader's Digest version of the 5G phone systems and what we need to be concerned about and what we should be doing about it. Sure. Uh, so 5G is the fifth generation of wireless signals. Right now, it's being installed in multiple U.S. cities. Uh, the plan is to uh, to have about, by the time this is posted, probably 30 cities in which you, you, you could technically connect your, your phone to the 5G system. And 5G is more speed, more fidelity, and for users, it means uh, 4K video streaming that's blazing fast, and that's this is really how how it's being sold. Uh, the the so downside. Means, sorry, it means you've got great entertainment while you're dying in the hospital. <laughs> well, <laughs> to to put it simply, yes. Uh, so what what happens is more radiation, right? Uh, so it's it's not only more. Uh, radiation, especially if you're close to antennas, and 5G demands closer antennas, uh, closer to human beings, and closer uh, from one another than ever before in history, because it's very high power, but very short distance. So it means we're uh, instead of having one cell phone tower or a few cell phone towers uh, every mile in downtown areas, for example, San Diego, I, I looked at it for a presentation last year, and it, ha it has something like 10 or 15 antennas in a one mile radius. So it was, 
yeah, it, it's dense, but it's not as dense as 5G because 5G is the small cell antennas. So small doesn't mean not powerful. It just means that they're hard to spot. Uh, so you, you have them uh, on every block or every three to 12 homes in residential areas. So again, if the industry rolls rolls this out and you ignore the rest of this conversation, uh, it sounds cool. It sounds like, oh, it's it's an improvement. If you are looking into EMFs and have recognized that, yeah, it's probably we need something we need to reduce, well, 5G is a disaster because it's going to tremendously increase our exposure. And then the other thing I mentioned about signal generator is also valid because 5G is an even more complex signal that has been engineered to make it so that you have uh, you can have multiple uh, streams of data going out and going in, kind of going both ways on a single channel. So in, in other words, it's a con- technology that's even more sophisticated, even more complex, and biologists who understand uh, the effects on, on, on our cells uh, say that we will probably see greater biological effects that are detrimental, more oxidative stress and more inflammation, even at lower levels. So it, it might be that a, a 5G signal is multiple times more harmful than a 4G. But I can't say that because the, 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 the cherry on top of bad news is that 5G is being rolled out without a single biological safety testing to back up its safety. Because again, going back to the, the first minute or minutes of this conversation, it's all based on the assumption that if it doesn't burn you, it does not hurt you. So again, it it is within the safety standards, which are set by the FCC and completely obsolete and broken. So technically, everything is fine. And this is in the industry's mind and, and people who work for the industry and, and users who don't know uh, better, it's, it, it, it's just an exciting time. The, what we could expect is more people who are starting to, to see the effects of all this uh, cellular stress, quite simply. What can people do about it is um, start talking about it, talking about the fact that they do not want 5G. There are a couple of, of petitions going on around. I don't know what's the efficacy of those, but at least you, you got to at least sign it. One of them is called the, the 5G Appeal. If you Google that, you're going to find it. You can sign your name on there. There's something over 60,000 people from uh, over 160 countries who have signed it. But moreover, you could uh, talk to your mayor or to your representative on a, on a city level, on a state level, and then on a, st- on a federal level to look at, is there is it possible to say no to 5G? You have the city of Brussels in Belgium, for example, who said no to 5G. You had uh, almost, well, a, a, a greater the greater part Part of uh, Switzerland that had said no to 5G, but then the, the another part of the government responsible for communications rolled it anyway. So <laughs> it yeah. is there's, there's a lot of controversy. Yeah, th- there's there's a lot of controversy about 5G because the we're seeing a, a worldwide movement about people saying, well you know what, I'm already concerned about 4G technology. Why roll 5G right now? We should adopt a, a precautionary principle and, and, and study 5G before it's rolled out and we just increase radiation. doesn't really make sense. And at the same time, you have the World Health Organization, uh, International Agency for Research of, of, uh, on Cancer, IARC, that is now considering, and that's news from two days ago, that is considering reclassifying EMFs uh, and probably looking at increasing the classification and how much of a carcinogen it is. It is a 2B carcinogen, and many, many independent scientists say, technically, if we look at the same criteria we used to classify it as 2B in 2011, it should be right now a class 1 definite carcinogen just right next to uh, its little cousins, asbestos and smoking. So yes. at the same time, you have that. And at the same time, the industry is increasing radiation. So does it really make sense? All in, uh, it does It does not, right? You can, I mean, you can, if you believe anything we've said in this conversation, we should probably aim to lower exposure. And what we have as far as cell phone speed, if, if you talk to the average person, is good enough. 
Yes. Uh, it, it's even more than we than we need. So 5G, we don't need it. And if you want to get involved, the best website to follow is ehtrust.org. And that's the Environmental uh, Health Trust. They are a nonprofit organization, probably the most important in the world right now. And they have tremendous information about how you can get uh, involved on a policy standpoint and discover, well, is 5G in my city? Can I oppose it? What can we do? And you have the mayor of the city of Portland who uh, who said, we're going to look at the health effects and we want to take action. We invite other mayors uh, uh, nationwide to do the same. So there are some good news. People are starting to wake up now because 5G is so invasive that it's going to be an antenna very close to your house. And it's almost uh, in, inevitable that it's going to be closer to your house than any, any, any time before in history. And people don't want that. They want radiation to expose other people, not themselves, right? So, But they do want the cell phone, though. So yeah. it, it, it's all a matter of densification and more, more and more problems. So that's the 5G story for you is just uh, more and more radiation in a world where clearly science tells us we should probably lower our exposure. Yeah, you know, I'm going to tell you a quick 5G, my first 5G experience that really shocked me. We were on vacation uh, last September. We took a cruise uh, uh, cruise ship to Alaska, and then we, uh, when the cruise ship stops at Seward, Alaska, which is way the hell up there. I mean, you're getting, you know, we're looking at glaciers and all sorts of stuff. So Seward's quite far north. And it's, you know, you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Well, one day, Penny, Angie, and Mana and I decided to take a helicopter ride that flies you out of town up into the mountains. And then it's like, I don't know, maybe three, four miles of hiking to get back down into the township. And there's trails that you can take back. So we thought, well, that'd be fun. And it wouldn't be too tough. Even if we have to carry Mana, a lot of it's going to be downhill. So we're up there. And we're in this huge bowl, like a crater that's very famous. They do concerts and stuff up there. But we're down inside this massive crater. And we were worried we might get separated from each other. So we said, well, I wonder if we have cell phone reception in here. And I picked up my phone and I had five bars of reception. And I'm like out in the middle of the forest way, you know, we flew out there in a helicopter and I'm like, this is bloody amazing. This signal is going through this mountain like it doesn't even exist. I had five bars. And and then and Angie said to me, that's because it's 5G. And then I looked at my phone, and here I am right here in Austin, Texas, and right up by the battery sign it says 5GE. So they're on 5G here. But strangely enough, I've only got one bar in this house. I had five bars way out in the mountains outside of a tiny little town. So when I got back down to town, the people that we're staying with, well, the guy used to be the mayor of the town. And I said, oh, my God, I was blown away. I had like perfect cell phone reception out there in the middle of the mountains. And in the entire time, no matter where we were on the trail, down in gullies, wherever the five bar signal was still there. And so the point I'm making is this signal strength is so strong. It, it's not like a lot of the cell phone frequencies we have. It seems to go right through almost anything. And then I recently read on on Sherry Tenpenny's Baxter uh, newsletter, which I highly recommend for everybody, which is uh, www.vaxxter.com, that Rhode Island is putting 5G antennas all over the place on their signal lights. And so that's quite <laughs> aggressive. Yeah, it's it's just it's exactly that. It's they they want to have densification everywhere, and there's no stop to it. So it's it, there's there's a stop if if you choose as a user to to just uh, either not partake in the technology or get involved to demand safer technologies. And I think it's super important. Let's talk more about the the the, the issues five G and all that um, when we can. But thanks for sharing. Sounds and good. Let everybody know where they can get. To your course, I think we have a special on your course, if I remember right. Uh, you, you do. So if you're listening to that between uh, May 1st and uh, the 20th, uh, Electrosmog RX, which is uh, in-depth information about EMS for health professionals, but also health enthusiasts, it is open to everyone who wants to get educated on the matter. And uh, you can visit Electrosmog 
rx.com slash check. Uh, C-H-E-K and uh, it's 32% off during this time uh, window. It's always available, but it's always a a nice rebate of $200. And uh, if you're just getting started in the conversation, uh, maybe a better fit is is to at least uh, read my book and you'll We've we we barely scratched on the solutions. Obviously, there are there are a lot of other solutions and ways to uh, reduce EMF exposure. And you can find it on Amazon. And it's called the Non Tin Foil Guide to EMFs. Uh, so, well, th- thanks thanks so much. Thanks for giving us the, all the love that you've shared today and the wisdom. And I can't recommend your book enough. And uh, Thanks for sharing your love with the world, Nick, and uh, have a great day. And I'll look forward to the next interview we can organize. Thanks so much, Paul. I'll, hopefully in person. I'm going to try to uh, to make it to the West Coast. I look forward to it. Big hug. Thank you so much. See you, bud. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Nick Pino. Connect with Nick through his YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Nick Pino, which is spelt N-I-C-K-P-I-N-E-A-U-L-T. If you are interested in learning more about how to prevent, recognize, and work with people suffering from EMF-related illnesses, then Paul recommends Nick's Electrosmog RX EMF course. Nick is offering a special course discount until May 20th. Go to tiny.cc forward slash EMF course for full details. You can also pick up a copy of Nick's book, The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMFs at tiny.cc forward slash EMF book. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living4d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's blog at checkinstitute.com forward slash blog.